Hi all, I am Sham. I have Kishan with me. Hi Sham. Uh, welcome to Free Float. This week uh, we are going to dissect the uh, Yale endowment portfolio. It's something that uh, is often uh, talked about uh, when the issue of uh, diversification and alternative uh, asset classes come up. Uh, so we have Kishan with us to uh, sort of take us through uh, uh, the why, the who, the what, and uh, who of, uh, uh, of this model. Uh, so Kishan, uh, can you start off by giving us a brief intro? Yeah. So Sham, I think, you know, like last week we discussed, you know, that, uh, you know, um, if you have a portfolio, you know, which is less than a pro, then you should not, you know, like bother about diversification. I mean, you know, about like hedging and, you know, like using derivatives and using complex strategies. But, you know, what if you don't, you don't have a portfolio of a pro, but you have like, say, of a few hundred crores or, or you know of a few thousand crores you know and well that seems like a good problem to have you know it you know creates you know uh it it provides you opportunities and it provides you problems you know because uh i think at that scale or at that uh you know you uh a you can get professional investment managers you need not depend on you know uh you know outside uh you know, like in this, at least you know, at least you know to divert your funds to the to the right people, you know. And if you, you know, if you have a, if you have a, you know, a good investment advisor, uh, you know, who is not just looking at, at you know, uh, where he looks at his investment mandate, and his and his investment mandate would would say, you know, uh, to provide, you know, say, uh, a certain return consistently over. A, a period of time and you know to have you know a sustainable uh, outflow from the fund portfolio which is like which has certain certain so you know say you say you will withdraw five percent of the fund to meet your daily expenses i mean i mean to meet your yearly expenses or your you know your uh, commitments and then the portfolio will go at like say 11 or 12 percent so you have about a growth of seven percent which is meant to uh, beat inflation and you know and and like and, and like and like to maybe generate some alpha above that and so you know so you do then start thinking about it right? you know um, say everyone invests in equities you know which is what Warren Buffett would say that you just put it in an index fund and forget about it uh, but uh, you need not do that you know I mean you can you know, look at a very different approach uh, which is what the Yale endowment ended up doing where. You know, a large person in portfolio went to alternative assets, uh, which are, you know, uh, private, private equity, venture capital, uh, hedge funds, uh, you know, natural resources, you know, like, you know, uh, like, you know, went the other way to what was you know, considered the, you know, the traditional asset mix, which is, you know, equity and, and debt. And I think, I think the objective here is, and, you know, this is, I mean, today venture capital and private equity, uh, you know, like, you know, like the, I like the oh, I like the hottest things out there, but you know, if you even 10, 20 years ago, uh, maybe like leveraged bio stuff were popular, but, but venture capital and you know, private equity, you know, I mean, uh, parts of it were still, you know, extremely niche, not not very big, you know, uh, very oriented to technology investors. So you know, for you to be focused in those areas, you have you would have to really be, you know, you would have to have some insight or some understanding of what's happening. And so the idea is, is that you know you break your portfolio up into multiple, you know, uh, you know, say units or you know, uh, uh, I mean allocations where a small percentage of portfolio is meant to provide you the liquidity that you need to you know meet your yearly expenses, and then you know you have a large chunk of portfolio which is meant to be long term oriented uh, because you know you're not looking to withdraw this, that capital, and the idea is that you know you go. Uh, the capital at a at a high rate, uh, but it's not consistent. So you know, uh, if you're in, if you're investing in much capital or like private equity, the, the terms are usually five to seven years. Uh, you know, and and you might and it might also have an extension on that. So you know, you're looking at uh, of a decade before you know you get your uh, return uh, or, or when you get your money back, and you're hoping that your money would have you know grown by a significant amount at that time. But it's not liquid. So you, so you, 
cannot withdraw your investment. So, but an endowment or a, even a large family in India has an advantage that they are not they're not dependent on like a on like a short term investment horizon. They don't need liquidity, uh, and what liquidity they need can be easily provided. And and a large sum portfolio can seek high returns without being you know, disturbed. And that changes how you invest. I mean, I would say. Right. But um, so a couple of things that stand out, right? So all these, uh, sorry. So all these uh, um, uh, this thing, right? Uh, uh, assets were, uh, you know, considered the alternative asset classes uh, 20 years ago. But, uh, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, if you look at venture capital or private equity or hedge funds, they are pretty much part of the mainstream, right? So, yeah. uh, so they are no longer alternative. So, uh, so uh, the the story here is, you know, uh, if you take a step back, I think it's about, um, you know, being uh, the first to invent a working investment strategy. Uh, rather than, uh, you know, kind of like, uh, oh, uh, invest in uh, alternatives and don't invest in, you know, traditional 60-40. So, uh, for, for me, the takeaway, uh, even with, uh, you know, Warren Buffett's strategy is the same. Um, it's not to, you know, uh, own what he's doing or what he's done. It's about, you know, having the uh, t- sort of testicular fortitude to think originally. Um, and think, uh, you know, different from what the other market uh, participants are uh, thinking like. And, uh, you know, and in the end of the day, make sure it works because if it doesn't work, then uh, nobody's going to write books about you. So, um, uh, so who, you know, uh, comes up with this original uh, investment strategy ends up, um, you know, uh, being uh, feated. So a lot of these asset classes today, right, uh, from venture capital to hedge funds to um, private equity, uh, have barely sort of uh, beaten the S&P 500 in the aggregate. So uh, there are so many players, uh, so many smart people in these, uh, you know, in these uh, subcategories that, uh, you know, it's very difficult for them to show alpha. So all that these endowments would do if they were, uh, you know, venturing into these sort of investments today uh, is just, uh, you know, generally trading liquidity um, and, uh, you know, and uh, uh, trading away the pain of, uh, you know, uh, regular mark to market um, uh, for, you know, for like longer duration markups. So, so basically, the idea is that, you know, a private equity will uh, mark their portfolio to model every six months. Uh, so during that time, you know, you're not going to see a lot of fluctuation in your portfolio so that you can sleep easy at night. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, other than that, the, you know, people are saying that there's no real benefit to owning these alternatives at this point. Uh, so if you yeah. were David Swenson, right, and you were given the mandate today, what would you do? Right, because Harvard tried the same thing, and they have gone, you know, they have gone through multiple, you know, uh, boom busts in hiring smart kids to manage their portfolio, and then, you know, seeing them underperform for uh, three years, and then panicking and firing them, and they have, you know, they have done this like two or three times already in the recent past, and uh, you know, the thing is, like, they tried to copy the Yale model, like having an in-house. Uh, you know, uh, fund management team who is going to do this, uh, but you know they have failed. And uh, you know, then you have examples like the Nevada pension fund, who, who just does 60/40 only index funds for them, right? And yeah. uh, they have, you know, and there's just like one or two guys in this whole pension fund managing billions of dollars. <laughs> and uh, he's like, yeah, you know, he's telling the rest of the guys that you guys are idiots, you know, because, uh, uh, you know, just two guys and you've done this and you've saved so much in fees and costs. And, uh, you know, anyway, none of these uh, other nitwits are going to beat the index. So what's the point? So while you take the example of, say, um, the California, uh, you know, uh, teachers retirement fund, right? Uh, the world famous one. 
and uh, you know they also uh, you know keep trying all this private equity and alternatives and hedge funds and all that and they and you know they too have not been able to uh, you know generate any meaningful uh, you know returns yeah. in the next recent so uh, so if you were uh, yeah. david swenson today right looking to invest yields endowment for the next 100 years what yeah. would you do? So I think for me, the lesson is not to replicate the portfolio, you know, like what David Spencer does. I think it's the approach, you know. So the approach is that, you know, uh, I think the idea is here to be less dependent on market sentiment, you know, uh, to be less dependent on the market going up or down, uh, and uh, and f- and to look for opportunities which are not being looked at, you know, which which traditional guys are not looked at. So you know, uh, you might have, you know, like. Uh, some opportunity like say today you know uh, warehouses are hot but if you had the insight like you know 10 years ago if some investment some investment manager came and told you you know uh, india's growth will be fueled by like e-commerce and you know there's a very uh, dirt of you know warehouses that you know uh, in india and you know this is this is probably a good opportunity to invest with a with a reasonable yield and you know with a high certainty I'll be very, you know, if someone came to me 10 years ago and said that, you know, I'll, I'll be interested in, you know, at least investing something because, you know, I believe in, in the potential and it's not something that it was hot, you know, like 10 years ago, you know. Uh, obviously, I'll do some homework and, you know, do the math and, you know, see how, how to go. But I think it's the approach, you know, it's, it's the approach of, you know, uh, having a, you know, a, a good return. Uh, 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 without, and, you know, and, and, and trying to get it at the... I mean, in a way, it's not dependent on you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, what the market thinks because the market, you know, you know, goes to a fluctuation. And like we have said that, you know, for you to invest, if you if you're investing in you know like a long-term investment horizon, you cannot just believe that the market will go up in a you know will 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 just continue to go up over a very very long period of time. You know, uh, I mean that's less certain. So. You know, I, I do agree that you that you cannot invest 100% or say 60% entirely into an index fund because you know what if the markets do not perform? Then what do you do? You know, I mean, uh, so you know, I, I do like the idea of diversification and diversifying in cases where the where you, where your source of return is not you know it's not the same. You know, so if I'm investing in farmland and then if I'm investing in some like a tech based uh, like tech stock strategy the source of returns for those two things are very you know different right um so i don't know man like for example if uh, you know if i had uh, uh, this problem right so supposing someone said uh, you know uh, i have 5 million dollars you know uh, invested for me uh, given where things are right now i would just set up a you know pod hedge fund right so it's yeah. sort of like a multi manager hedge fund uh, where you have uh, uh, you know 20 or um, you know 30 odd uh, different managers running different strategies each managing his or her you know portfolio and i would just provide the infrastructure so that they don't have to worry too much about legal and fundraising and uh, you know uh, and all that stuff and uh, you know um, I, I would be crossing their trades at, at the you know at the top level so that you know if one manager is selling apple and the other guy, guy is buying apple so i can just cross it internally without hit, hitting the market so the, the you know so i would probably do that because uh, i feel uh, it's easy to find uh, strategies that beat the market if you don't have to scale it so there are a lot of small opportunities in the market um, you know either in derivatives or options or uh, you know call it momentum or pair trading or whatever it is it will work for small amounts of capital it will not scale to 5 billion so if you uh, line up you know 20 or 30 different guys who are all doing uh, you know small uh, who are all managing small amounts of capital with differentiated strategies i think that will kind of replicate what swenson tried to do 20 years ago um so um so i would probably try that uh, you know rather than so so would you invest so would you invest the entire 5 billion into into trading pods yeah. so that's what i would do okay. so 
um, so you see, one of these pods are bound to kind of do something that is, uh, you know, large capital, uh, but, you know, uh, hugging the index or high beta to the index, right? So, uh, so my requirement over there is kind of uh, fulfilled. So not everybody is going to do long short or not everybody is going to, uh, you know, do a trend following or uh, international investing. So they're right. going to be diversified inside. So I would select those 30 guys so that, you know, the new guy who comes in is not, you know, doing the same thing that the other guys do. Right. Okay. That's interesting. I mean, I think, you know, uh, you can see this as in, um, in, in, in a different way also, right? Like, you know, um, do you want to be, uh, do you want to invest a large quality of money into the markets? Because, you know, the markets comes uh, volatility and, you know, uncertainty. And, and so, uh, and it become very, you know, like very uh, personal. Like, you know, say if, if there's an opportunity where you can earn like 12 or 30% return, uh, you know, uh, and there's high certainty with no, with no volatility. And if you think that, you know, from the market, your return will be similar, I mean, over the long run, uh, as, as an average, uh, I think, you know, uh, people would prefer the, I mean, the one with the most opportunity, like, you know, I mean, owning some commercial property or owning some, you know, uh, you know, owning some asset like that, because it, you know, would provide them the, uh, it provides them the certainty. And it doesn't apply. Yeah, so I'm looking at this from another angle, right? So, for example, um, uh, recently I was uh, reading about, uh, you know, uh, inter-exchange arbitrage in the crypto space, right? So, like, you know that uh, cryptocurrencies have, uh, you know, uh, a huge number of exchanges, so they're all unregulated, but they have a lot of exchanges. So you take the, you know, the top five or something. Uh, the rules that they use are completely different. So there's no, you know, uh, equality in rules uh, that say, for example, Coinbase uses versus, uh, you know, Bitfinex or whatever. So uh, the rules that they use for market, uh, for uh, matching orders and how your order, order modification and so on are all yeah. very different. So, uh, you know, so there, there is a hedge fund out there which is trying to exploit, you know, these inefficiencies. But the problem for them is it is not, you know, like a billion dollar opportunity. It is at best, you know, uh, like a $200 million opportunity. So once they, you know, invest in, uh, you know, the hardware and the licenses required, uh, it, it is not something that can scale, in, you know, indefinitely. But the thing is that opportunity exists, and uh, you know, as a pod, I, I can, you know, uh, I can have that as one of the strategies that uh, you know that I'm running parallelly, that has almost zero correlation to the market. So, so this is how I would approach uh, this. So if I have a whole bunch of uncorrelated strategies running then that, that is enough for me. You know, I don't want to necessarily, you know, invest in uh, a particular asset because it takes a box for me, right? Um, so I don't have to necessarily invest in commercial real estate or uh, warehousing or uh, airports or whatever, just because, you know, it is considered to be an alternative asset class and I need to allocate against it, right? So Spencer never had this checklist. He never... I, when he started off, there was nobody sitting there and telling him that, you know, uh, these are the 20 different alternative asset classes. So just split yeah. your endowment between them. Nobody uh, told him. Yeah. yeah, he came up yeah. with it himself. So that's why he's a genius, right? So now every every Tom, Dick and Harry is trying to do this. So, yeah, and failing because they're just copying. They're not, you know, thinking about this originally. So, uh, so the so that's basically how I would approach it. Uh, but, you know, I don't have $5 million. So <laughs> that's such a different thing uh, <laughs> altogether. But you, would, but you would even do that, you know, um, say if you had a smaller sum, right? uh, say 50 crores or even 100 crores, you would take the same approach. Yes, absolutely. So I would, you know, I would go for uh, uh, unrelated strategies rather than, uh, you know, uh, look at it from an asset 
point of view. Okay. Okay. And 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 you think that you can find the say 10, 12 strategies which are undiversified. Yeah, absolutely. Like you know, like which are which are like unpolluted sir. I mean, which provide enough diversification. Right. So, you know, it, it is possible. Uh, the, the biggest stumbling block I see nowadays is not actually finding the strategy. It is finding strategies that scale. It's easy to find smaller opportunities rather than finding big ones that satisfy, you know, a large allocation. So, yeah. Uh, so that's one. And the second thing is, you know, there's this thing uh, referred to as the Shannon's demon, right? So, uh, you know, the idea is that, you know, if you have two uh, assets, for example, one is, uh, you know, low volatility um, and the other is a highly volatile asset and they're not correlated yeah. to each other, right? Um, and both have, you know, positive expected returns. So, you know, you can obviously do it with some dumbass asset. So you, you have two assets, both are kind of going up. One is extremely volatile, the other is kind of steady and they're not correlated to each other. Then just by rebalancing often, you will beat both those indices. Then you'll beat both those assets, right? So, so, so the thing is, there is there are things like this that you can do, but these opportunities are very, uh, you know, small uh, in comparison to the billions that you know a regular hedge funds run. So, if you if you are just looking at you know um, uh, even something like you know one crore, for example, right? You can find these strategies, and uh, you know they would be very niche. And just that's not yeah. Yeah, and you can, I, I think for one pro, you can find enough strategies on small scale. Yeah, so you can just you know run the shit out of it. And uh, I, I and the other thing is um, you know you should look at this from um, uh, another point of view as well. So for example, if you have um, a long only strategy in a market, it's highly unlikely that its sharp ratio is going to consistently beat the benchmark's sharp ratio. So yeah. um, if you want uh, stability, then, you know, jamming different, you know, uh, strategies that, uh, that are based off the same market and that is long only is not going to help you that. So, yeah. uh, for, you know, um, uh, mixing, a, you know, momentum and value in India, you know, don't expect that uh, portfolio to do, to do magic for you. Uh, but if you mix, say, uh, you know, uh, Indian momentum with US value, for example, then you have then, yeah uh, some potential there. So, um, so once again, you know, uh, it's a question of aggregating all these uh, uh, statistics into a uh, you know in, into a coherent portfolio, and uh, I would probably use that approach and just construct it based off liquid uh, markets. Right. But then, you know, uh, Sham, I mean, say, if, if you're, a, you know, if you're like advising to a wealthy family in India, right? Uh, and I think, you know, uh, that's the most relatable that you can get in India. And the family has, say, multiple objectives that it wants to serve, you know, uh, meet its, you know, some annual expenses and, you know, uh, and say, and say you can consolidate all the accounts and stuff, right? And, and your approach would be instead of you know diversifying into different assets, still to choose you know uh, the trading uh, strategy approach because you think it's it's easier to manage. Absolutely, it's uh, you know liquid yeah. assets are a lot easier to manage, and meeting these objectives are easier with liquid assets. So, for example, in commercial real estate, right? Um, you know, uh, it's one thing if you are well so wealthy that you can diversify across geographies. So you buy a warehouse in Bangalore, you buy some office space in uh, Gurgaon, and then you will buy a you know vacation rental in Greece or you know uh, a farmhouse in uh, the US. So you can do that, and uh, you know maybe then you can rest easy. But uh, you know if, if you manage to buy five the... roads, you, you largely get a warehouse in Bangalore. So you, all your eggs yeah, yeah. in one basket. So. <laughs> yeah, and 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 also you know it it takes a lot of you know effort to do all these things. Like, you know, if you do, if you if you actually own a uh, commercial real estate, you have a lot of problems that come, you know, with it from taxation to maintaining it and you know following up on you know utilities and stuff. So 
there's a lot of headache that and unless you are someone who's doing for you and you know uh, or you're investing with with people who know what they're doing it's not really the smartest thing that you can do yeah i, I mean this is the marriott uh, approach right so they don't own the property they just uh, you know put the stamp of approval and um, you know and they manage the property for the uh, the asset owner because they realized a long time ago that uh, owning uh, real estate is a very local affair and if you are like yeah. this uh, cowboy who comes in from the us and wants to buy a property in you know i don't know in bangalore then you're going to get your ass handed to you so they'd rather just uh, you know um, Uh, enter into a management agreement with a local real estate uh, you know guy and, and say that uh, you know here's here's my logo here's everything you just give me you know a steady stream of income for for managing this yeah. um so uh, so they realized this uh, a while ago and they've been very successfully doing this and uh, in terms of uh, you know managing this uh, you know from a uh, physical day to day affair right it's brutal man uh you know there are like a million yeah. things that go wrong you know from uh, you need like a regular uh, uh team to just look after this i don't think people realize how difficult it is to be a landlord <laughs> you know before they get yeah and yeah. <laughs> and, and, the, and the problem in india is that you know you have a lot of people offering things but it's all unregulated all in the gray area you know i'm i'm sure some people are good but some people are also you know uh who don't know what they're doing so you know you'll just end up having more problems yeah and uh, good luck uh, you know when you try to sell this property because uh, you know when you buy you buy uh, the broker the same broker you know this uh, somebody posted this uh, about uh, you know the wall street uh, movie uh, the first one uh, where bud fox is buying his apartment and uh, you know the real estate lady is like uh, you know it's a very hot market you know i got a bid in like today yeah, yeah. you better and then uh, you know when he's trying to sell it look man the market is really bad <laughs> 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 and it hasn't changed <laughs> you know it's the same yeah, story yeah, yeah, yeah. everywhere when you buy everybody you know the guy trying to sell it to you is like this is going to be the next you know blah 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 and and you know when you go to sell yeah he's like uh, um manyana dude yeah. <laughs> so yeah i know i know it's real estate it's, it's a whole different thing but um you know uh, but what i've seen over a period of time is i there, maybe there was a time when there was this liquidity premium where uh, you know you get paid for owning illiquid assets like private equity when yeah. the capital all locked in for like you know 10 15 years uh but uh, that uh, premium has gone away because everybody is chasing the, the same opportunity side and uh, you know uh, that no longer pays all you get is you know low mark to market volatility because it's mark to model so uh, you know and that's all you get so you pay for that privilege so i'd rather be diversified across liquid strategies yeah i get that yeah <laughs> so anyway but uh, like i said you know swenson warren buffett all these guys man uh, yeah, they're great because they invented a strategy that worked um but if you try and copy the same thing now you know it's uh, you're just being an ass yeah. so so the thing is you know invent something on your own um uh, and yeah. make sure that it works right uh, but uh, yeah and, and like be so sure, be so sure, like don't do it because you think it's just... like like don't do it because you just like feel like it, you know like you know there's work involved like you know like thinking through then like you know working it out and then you know like having a, a strong conviction which is based on and you know, like realistic numbers you know yeah absolutely all right uh, so with that i think we'll conclude uh, this week's uh, free float so uh, you know i hope um, the uh, swenson article is like a good uh, jumping off point uh, but uh, you know uh, be wary of copying it as is um so we'll catch you again next week